In the last video of this lesson, we'll talk about nuclear weapons briefly. So, nuclear weapons were developed after Einstein's special theory of relativity showed that energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. So, previously to this, weapons, bombs, were chemical devices, where a chemical reaction would release energy, TNT or modern C4, a chemical bomb where a fertilizer mixed with something, uh, some accelerant, you know, can create an explosive release of energy, as an example. After Einstein's special theory of relativity showed that energy and mass were equivalent, it was realized that you could break up heavy nuclei into lighter nuclei and release energy. In that process, you can create a fission bomb. And while Einstein was against, of course, nuclear weapons, his theory was out. And once the theory was out, there's very little you can do to control governments from exploiting an advantage, especially during a war. So the US developed what's called the Manhattan Project during World War II. And this was a secret project in the US to develop an atomic bomb. Now, it was known at the time that Germany was also working on developing an atomic bomb. Soviet Union was working on developing the atomic bomb. The Manhattan Project, the hope was the U.S. would be the first to have this weapon and then hopefully not use it or use it in a demonstration purpose to stop the war. Interestingly, the German part of World War II, uh, the invasion of Germany actually ended before the bomb was finished. But while Germany surrendered, Japan, another Axis power, did not. So the Manhattan Project eventually was used, the bombs, early bombs developed in the Manhattan Project were used in Japan to help end World War II. Now, huge amounts of, of course, historical debate on whether or not it was necessary to use atomic weapons. Uh, the will of the Japanese people to continue the war, the cost in American lives of a land invasion, and so on. A lot of arguments go into whether or not it was a good idea for the U.S. to drop the bomb. I don't want to get into the politics, I just want to talk a bit about the history. The first bomb dropped was actually a uranium-235 gun-type trigger, which meant that there was a little sphere of uranium with a hollow point, a uranium bullet. The uranium bullet was fired into the uranium sphere, creating a large quantity of uranium, enriched uranium, which went critical. Again, enough pure uranium, it wasn't pure, but enough enriched uranium too close together, it basically turns into a bomb on its own. So, this was one type of bomb, they called this Fat Man. It was dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. About 10 kilotons of TNT equivalent. So this one bomb, which contained just a few kilograms, I believe, of uranium, was the equivalent of 10,000 tons of a chemical explosive like TNT showing how much energy is stored in the atomic nucleus compared to chemical energy. So nuclear power is far richer, far more dense energy-wise than chemical power is. Second one was actually a different type of bomb. It was a plutonium-239 bomb and it had what's called an implosion trigger. So basically it was a bunch of plutonium just beyond criti criticality, so it did not have a chain reaction going on. I mean, it was decaying, but not enough to precipitate a chain reaction that would keep it going. Explosives were placed around it in such a way that when those chemical explosives were detonated, it compressed the plutonium into a smaller volume. The same amount of plutonium in the smaller volume exceeded the density necessary for criticality. It went super critical and exploded. So there was basically an experiment. They tested two different types of triggers. They weren't sure, right? They hadn't really played around much with these types of uh, weapons. So they were testing, more than anything, how to build a nuclear bomb.
or held by an atomic bomb. Second one, little boy was dropped on Nagasaki on August 9th, 1945. And those were the, actually the only two weapons developed by the US at that point. After little boy was dropped, the US had no more nuclear weapons. It only built two. It was in the process of continuing to build more, of course, but if Japan had not surrendered after the Nagasaki bomb, it would have been a while before a third nuclear bomb was dropped, if any, uh, on the Empire of Japan, because we basically only built these two initially. Now, again, both of these bombs released kilotons of power. But since the bombs have dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Soviet Union, the US, and there are a few other nuclear powers in the world. Pakistan is now a nuclear power. Israel is, but I believe the US gave them their nuclear arsenal. I don't think Israel developed the nuclear bomb on its own. Uh, Germany, I'm not sure about. Britain, I believe, is a nuclear power. Uh, France, I believe, is a nuclear power. There's, there's a handful of countries that are, uh, have the bomb, have nuclear weapons. Research into nuclear power did not end with the dropping of Little Boy. Eventually, in the 1950s, 1960s, a fusion bomb was developed. A fusion, remember, is the combining of light nuclei into heavier nuclei. So a fusion bomb is often referred to as a hydrogen bomb because it's primarily hydrogen that fuses into heavier elements and releases energy. But remember that fusion requires a tremendous amount of temperature, like at the core of our sun, 15 million Kelvin, in order for fusion to be a self-sustaining reaction. So in order to create that environment in a weapon for fusion to occur, it still uses an atomic or fission bomb to trigger the fusion mechanism. So hydrogen bombs aren't any cleaner than atomic bombs uh, because they still have atomic bombs in them. They're still producing a lot of atomic waste, but they're far more powerful. The most powerful hydrogen bomb developed, I believe, is 50 or so megatons. So 50 million tons of TNT in one explosive device. Now, an interesting side product of the explosion of Fat Man and Little Boy. After the dawn of the nuclear era, once test, once the, these bombs were dropped and other bombs were tested, these are the only two nuclear weapons used in war, but a lot of countries have tested nuclear weapons since then. They're, these byproducts, the daughter products of these fission reactions, have gotten in, into our environment. And I found an interesting side effect. It allows us to actually help in detecting old forgeries of paintings. Because if you claim to have a painting by Da Vinci, an original Da Vinci, well, Da Vinci painted before, or Michelangelo, Michelangelo, Da Vinci, Raphael painted before the nuclear era. So their paint does not contain any of those isotopes of the daughter products from nuclear weapons. Whereas all paint and all basic products after the dawn of the nuclear era contain small amounts of these daughter products. So you literally cannot forge a ancient master's work anymore because modern tools can detect that the paint that you used actually came about after the development of nuclear weapons. Kind of a crazy, uh, interesting fact. So, nuclear weapons, there's enough nuclear weapons on the planet basically to destroy any country uh, multiple times over. Uh, the US has not developed any nuclear arsenal lately because we have so many already, but those are getting older. Uh, and how much do you invest in keeping up nuclear weapons? Do we decommission all nuclear weapons? Can we trust that other countries won't do that? There are still countries like North Korea that are, actually North Korea is now a nuclear uh, power, but developing more powerful and more reliable nuclear bombs. So we're in the nuclear era. I don't think we're gonna be leaving it anytime soon. Uh, and the history of the development of the Manhattan Project is a fascinating reading. BBC has done a wonderful documentary on what it was like in Hiroshima when the bomb was dropped and after the bomb was dropped. A uh, wonderful movie called Fat Man and Little Boy that follows the development of the Manhattan Project in a dr dramatized uh, setting. But uh, if you're interested in U.S. history and science, this is a good crossroads between the two subjects.